Welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Good evening. Welcome. So welcome to Civil War to Civil Rights installment three called Reconstruction, A Taste of Freedom. So tonight you are in for something special, something different if you've been tuning in with us for our last couple installments. Tonight, Gail and I will be presenting together. So we're going to be talking all about Reconstruction um, and kind of doing a zoom in on what made it special in Lincolnville. How did Lincolnville kind of develop in this Lincolnville? Wow. How did Lincolnville develop in this Reconstruction time period? <laughs> and um, just kind of explore and delve deeper. So with that, I will get started right now. And let's get started with our presentation. Okay, one moment. So while Kimler is doing that, I'd still like to thank you guys for joining in tonight and for the uh, all the times you've joined in with us. I hope you'll continue to follow what we're doing here and support the work that we're doing at the Lincolnville Museum because we just wanna bring you programming that will uh, make this history come alive for you. Perfect timing. All right. So we have Lincolnville and we're going to be talking about reconstruction. So first of all, what is reconstruction? What is it all about? So we are looking at the time period after the physical, the political and the ideological devastation of the Civil War. What happens to a nation after it's torn itself apart? How, how is the nation going to restructure and move forward after this momentous occasion? So one question in the forefront of everyone's mind, how would the newly freed black population get involved in this equation? Would they be incorporated into the public? Would they be cast to go somewhere else? In the ensuing years, there were a lot of kind of controversies and questions and debates and contestions over just that. Who would prevail? Who would be in charge of the new Republic? And um, kind of what would we see going forward? So. Looking at Reconstruction, we have a couple different stages that we'll be talking about tonight. So our first one starts with wartime Reconstruction. So this is all about the Freedmen's Bureau, which is where we'll start in 1865, so right after the end of the Civil War. The Freedmen's Bureau was established in March of 1865 as the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands. So commonly known as the Freedmen's Bureau, it, this organization was tasked with kind of easing the freedmen into the social and political and economic life in the South. So originally it was just gonna be a one year program, but then the Bureau was renewed for two more years in, um, with the Freed Freedmen's Bureau Act in 1866. And um, Jennifer, Jennifer, I say that every time I said it in practice, General Oliver O. Howard, was, who's the namesake for Howard University, a historically backed college and university in Washington, DC. So Howard was appointed to be the national commissioner. Um, and so right here, we kind of just have an illustration of the establishment of the Freedmen's Bureau. And then coming up shortly, you'll actually see, this is one of the um, circulars that they would have carried. So at the top, you see, the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen and Abandoned Lands. And at the bottom, you see the orders were sent by order of Brigadier General O. Brown. So on our next slide, you'll see shortly, you'll see Mr. Howard, General Howard. And then we will move on to talk about the Freedmen's Bureau more specifically in Florida. Because the Freedmen's Bureau was active throughout the South, but it had specific departments that were in different areas. So the head of the Florida department was this gentleman, Colonel T.W. Osborne. And so Osborne would travel across the state. The Freedmen's Bureau in Florida was first established in Tallahassee in 1865. In May of 1867, the office moved to Jacksonville. And then it was even here in St. Augustine for the briefest amount of time between August and November of 1868. Um, according to the museum, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, the Bureau off offered rations to both freedmen and white refugees, which is why they added refugee to the name later on, so they could serve white populations as well. Kind of refugees in general, people who were displaced during the war. Um, mm -hmm. it, 
supervise labor contracts between planters and freedmen, which was like a very important kind of key role that they played. Administered justice, worked with benevolent societies and the establishment of schools, another really key role. <laughs> and then assisted freedmen in locating land. And so something that's kind of an important distinction about the Freedmen's Bureau in Florida is that here in Florida, we had kind of the most amount of homesteads that were given to free, uh, newly freed black people than any other public land state, which is kind of cool. So, so oh yeah, hey Gail, you're here. <laughs> something yeah. else that is um, really interesting is because the Freedmen's Bureau started as a military um, kind of offshoot, they kept really good meticulous records. So one record that you'll see in a second is a record um, of a rations request. And so you'll see it has the name, the age, the district, the owner of the plantation. So even the road and the distance where it was located. Something also um, to note, which is really interesting, especially looking at like the history of people with disabilities throughout time. Um, they have the nature of the disability. So if people were blind, old and infirm, like the person listed here, if they had children. And so these um, kind of records are a treasure trove now. You can do a lot of cross-referencing and find people kind of as they pop up throughout the South and um, just kind of get a better idea for the populations that the Bureau served. So one such that we have as well. Um, oh, actually, I forgot about this one. So here again is just another record and it's showing across the top, the name of the people, their designation, when they served, how much they were paid, by whom they were owned, which was something also that's really unique about Freeman's Bureau records. Um, often they'll link the former enslavers. And so that's another really good research tool if you're ever doing genealogy like that. Um, coming up soon, we'll have the Freedmen's Bureau application of Mr. William Hewlin, who was a runaway, who enlisted in the Company B of the U.S. Colored Troops, um, the 1st Regiment South Carolina Volunteer Infantry. So after the war, he and his wife settled here in St. Augustine. They had four children, George, John, Cato, and Julia. Um, Mr. Hewlin passed away and was actually buried at the St. Augustine National Cemetery here in town. And so another cool thing about this record, if you watched our last installment, you'll see a name that you might recognize. So January 1863, right? Ooh, let me move the mouse so you can see. Right here, right here in the middle, you'll see that he was at Camp Saxon. So in South Carolina, Beaufort, South Carolina, we have his complexion. He was light, he was 5'2", he was 30. And then something else really interesting is we can see the names of other people that he served with. So Thomas Hernandez and Martin Natil. And this name Natil comes up a lot, Gail. Uh, we've seen it come up quite a bit. It does. So I, I think another interesting thing in here, Kimberlyn, is you look, when we were talking about how some of the soldiers and some of the people coming back were actually mulattoes. And you know the fact that he had blue eyes, that speaks a little bit about his heritage or ancestry. And um, also that um, you're able to find these, most of our soldiers ended up at Camp Saxon. So it's not always just finding what's here in St. Augustine and you've done a good job of finding some of those records and it makes, it brings it to life really. Yeah, um, it's, it's really interesting. And so we can kind of brag a little bit here. So there are some students um, at UNF with their digital humanities initiative who are kind of pouring through these right now and trying to find some of these stories that really humanize people who were here either from St. Augustine or ended up living in St. Augustine through these USCT records and the Freedmen's Bureau. So I'm really excited to see what they come up with. And then maybe after we get some more good information, we can come back and share it with you all. Hey. So um, all of these things, we're moving on the track the way that they were going yeah. to until a momentous occasion, April 14th, 1865, where President Lincoln was assassinated by the pro-Confederate actor John Wilkes Booth while watching a play at the Ford's Theater in Washington, DC. So um, something that I learned when putting this together, his Secretary of State, William Seward, was simultaneously attacked in his home while he was recovering mm -hmm. from an accident. So this was like an orchestrated thing. Um, and so this act really changed the course of the nation um, because of who ended up following afterwards. And so it's, it's interesting to kind of look at 
Lincoln's plan for reconstruction because his plan was initially very lax. And if Lincoln is characterized as being this person who um, would listen to advice and was willing to change and take in other points of view. So we see, um, well, to do all that in order to preserve the union as we see. So Lincoln moves from this idea of black troops being this complete no-no and something he never allowed to seeing the political and the moral usefulness of it and then having the Emancipation Proclamation come. So he shows that he's malleable and, and open to change. So his original plan for reconstruction was having 10% of the Confederacy um, sign this oath to the union and 10% seems crazy. It seems so low, but, um, right. So as we were talking about this, it was just like, what would it look like? And you're going to go into Jackson in a minute Yeah. to see that it may or may not have been that different under Lincoln because of his, uh, you know, more moderate, uh, view of how emancipation really should take take place so and then the reconstruction plans were uh, also reflected his original view of emancipation which was not necessarily to free all blacks at one time exactly. but he was forced to do it because of the attack at um fort sumter and um i think it's it's kind of something illuminating too because this other kind of competing plan for reconstruction um, the Wade Davis bill was put forward. And so I always remembered it in school, not WD-40, WD-50, because they wanted 50% of the Confederates to um, sign the oath rather than 10. Um, and then Lincoln pocket vetoed it. So he, <laughs> he it, it's just like, it's something interesting. So as we kind of go through, we'll, we'll see how the, the nature of the people involved impacted the course of reconstruction. So we've hinted at him so long, let's just go ahead and bring him out. We have Lincoln's vice president, who would later become the president, Andrew Johnson. So talking about how backgrounds and experiences kind of address, not really address, but inform how people act. So Andrew Johnson uh, was born poor in Tennessee. He worked as a tailor. Um, once he entered politics, he really advocated for poor white Southerners. Um, he had this deep resentment of the ruling class that followed him throughout his life. Um, during the secession crisis, he actually remained in the Senate in Tennessee. Um, he served both in the House of Representatives and as a senator. Um, and so by refusing to secede with the rest of the state, the Northerners were amazed. They loved him and the Southerners despised him. <laughs> and um, he would be later promoted to the military general of Tennessee by President Lincoln. And then of course, picked to be his running mate to kind of bring in this faction of, um, of like the not secessionist Democratic Party. But we we're talking about Reconstruction and Kent, President Andrew Johnson had a completely different view of Reconstruction. He saw the black politi political political oh tongue twister. He saw black political equality as something that was not even to be considered. And so his plan for Reconstruction was to make the moneyed classes beg him for pardons. And so he asked pardons for uh, lower Confederates and then had the upper echelon come and ask for them in person. Um, so he kind of makes it less political and more of like a, not even quid pro quo, but like a, a power trip sort of thing. Um, so in the wake of this happening, he's planning all these things while Congress is not in session. And so it's 1865. And um, in this time between this year and the next couple of years, the Southern states who now think this is just going to be the way it goes, we go right back into political power, we've gotten all these pardons from the president, they start drafting these um, things called black codes. So, oh, before we leave, yeah, this is the pardon of the grand uh, wizard, the first grand wizard of the KKK, Nathan Bedford Forrest, who also massacred tons of people during the war. Um, so I might to add, excuse me, before we go, you go to that, just a sidebar, Nathan Bedford Forrest, uh, there's been a lot of controversy recently because of the school in Jacksonville that was named after him. And as we look back at his record, we know that he massacred hundreds of people. So that's so. So yeah. Nice yeah. hand sign. You can see his name for the pardon of Nathan B. Forrest and B. Forrest, Washington, July 1868. So 1868 was a uh, pivotal year, 1868 and 1869. Um, by the time Johnson was done, he signed somewhere in the realm of 13,000 pardons for ex-Confederates. 
Um, and so, like I was saying, he's kind of formulating all these plans while Congress is not in session. And once the so-called radical Republicans, so these were the Republicans who wanted the integration of uh, black people into the political and social network of the country. And so once the radical Republicans heard what was going on, they were scandalized. And one of the things that scandalized them were these black codes. So these black codes were essentially these laws that were created to be extremely restrictive and um, pretty much relegate black people back to slavery in another way. Um, so we can see if you wanted to read yeah, some of them. There's you know. just a, a, few, a few of them um, that no person shall be a representative unless he be a white man. No man shall be a senator unless he be a white man. That every person who shall have one eighth or more of Negro blood be deemed and held to be a person of color. That's that one drop rule. That it shall not be lawful for any Negro, mulatto, or other person of color to own, use, or keep in his possession or under his control, any bowie knife, dirk, sword, firearm, or ammunition of any kind. No Negro, mulatto, I, and let me go back to that because as we see this moving forward, the um, blacks who wanted to form militias, that was the rule against that, um, to defend themselves against the KKK that was by this time, you know, taken, um, great um, roles in the um, persecution of, of, of Blacks. Uh, no Negro, mulatto, or other person of color shall intrude himself or any religion or other public assembly of white persons or any other railroad car or other public vehicle. So that's the separation um, rules that they came up with. No white female resident within this state shall thereafter attempt to intermarry or shall live in a state, adult, state of adultery or fornication, fornication with any Negro, mulatto, or other person of color. And each state, this is kind of like a generalized thing but each state had their own set of codes that they would eventually become you know uh the state laws that um every the southern democrats would uh always pull out is how we should be ruled as opposed to being led by the federal government and if i remember correctly i think mississippi created the first code in 1865 and then the other southern states quickly followed after and so some of them were even kind of stricter than the ones that we have listed here like talking about being able to defend yourself not even physically but also legally black people weren't allowed to testify against whites mm -hmm. some of the laws restricted the movement so you couldn't leave and go find another job unless you had the express permission of your former employer um and it's kind of interesting because some black codes actually like recognized the ability of black people to own property so it's like you had some kind of legal protections mixed in with all of these restrictions. So it, it was kind of interesting. Um, so let's see. So now we are kind of moving into this point where the radical Republicans are stepping up against Johnson and really trying to get some legislation passed. And so they're trying to really undo what he's been putting together. Um, and so now we have our timeline and we're moving into what we call congressional reconstruction. So now the radical Republicans in Congress are the ones who are pushing the laws and pushing the policy that will follow. So uh, December of 1865, the 13th Amendment was abolished, which abolished slavery was ratified. Um, Gail, you were talking about the rise in kind of Klan violence and just white mm -hmm. supremacist violence in general. So we have that same month in 1865, the Ku Klux Klan was founded in Pulaski, Tennessee. Um, in 1866, we have the first Civil Rights Act passing. And so the Civil Rights Act was really a precursor to the 14th Amendment. It declared that um, people in the U.S. Who are born here are all citizens and they have certain rights that could not be taken away from them so that included like the right to make contact not contacts excuse me contracts to own property to sue in court so you see how this is a kind of direct response to these black codes that are being created and trying to ensure Absolutely. these protections on the federal level if they can't be insured on the state level but they were kind of scared that it would be seen as unconstitutional. So that's why they try and codify it in or codify it in the 14th Amendment. But we'll get to that. 
Um, yeah, I, so. I think an interesting, excuse me, Kim, an in yeah. interesting thing is that, you know, you had the 13th Amendment, which was kind of like the Freedom Amendment. And these Black codes is why we needed additional amendments to just say, you cannot make a rule on a state level, on a local level that will supersede this. And mm -hmm. these Black codes were their way of getting around the 13th Amendment. Exactly. Um, and so we have kind of this legal circumvention, and then we have the employment of violence. So the spring and summer of 1866, there is a massacre in Memphis and a massacre in New Orleans. So racialized violence against Black citizens there. Um, and so these two things happening also spurred Northerners to think that Black, Southern, Black Southerners needed stronger protection, which also leads to the 14th Amendment. Um, in response to this as well, there's the Reconstruction Act of 1867. So this is really what outlines the terms where former Confederate states can re-enter the Union. It breaks the states down into military districts. Mm -hmm. It makes them have to sign oaths to the uh, Republic or to the Union rather to get reinstated in. Um, oh, very important. It makes a um, qualification of statehood to be the ratification of the 14th and the 15th Amendment. So you tacitly have to agree that these are the things our state is going to uphold to even come back into the Union. Florida decides that's amenable to us. So June 25th, 1868 of the next year, Florida is readmitted into the Union. And then the 14th Amendment is ratified the next month in 1868. All right, anything to add? Uh, no, I, I mean, we we're going to come into a little bit more what um, some of the people um, from the Florida uh, new constitution and when they come back and form the new con constitution, it comes a little bit later, but I think we yeah. should move on. Yeah. All right. So here we have kind of some of the responses to Johnson's behavior during this time period. So two of the things that we talked about, the Civil Rights Act of 1866 and the 1867 Reconstruction Act with the military districts, Johnson vetoed both of them. Um, and so Congress had to override his presidential veto that time and many other times. And so hmm. Johnson was like quite obviously not on board with what was happening. And um, to the point where this, along with another kind of thing that spurred this whole thing, ends with his impeachment. Uh, Congress said that Johnson had gone too far with his presidential powers, and he was acquitted only with the margin of one vote. So the first impeachment process in American history. So I think another interesting sidebar yeah. is that in um, their last presidency that um, Johnson was um, sort of viewed as sort of like a, a hero or a mentor, and we see some of the same kind of actions in that administration that we saw in the Johnson administration. Ah, uh, yes. Thank you for bringing that up, because there's something that's not on the slide, but I wanted to bring up. So uh, Christmas Day is either 1868 or 1869. It had to be 1868. Um, Johnson essentially issues a blanket pardon to all Confederates uh, that he didn't sign the 13,000 pardons for at that point. So um, that just kind of shows you what Johnson thought the political priority of the nation should be and uh, keeping Black people safe from violence and welcoming them into the political sphere was not part of it. Um, so continuing with our timeline, we have on March 4th, 1868, Ulysses S. Grant sworn in as president, and this election is really noteworthy because it was the first election where Black men could vote. And so some people estimate that the margin of votes, I think I've seen the number of about 300,000 of Black votes is what helped Ulysses S. Grant win. Mm -hmm. So the next year we have the 15th Amendment ratified, and I realize we should have been going through and describing what they are, just in case somebody in the audience doesn't know. But anyway, the 15th Amendment has all to do with enfranchisement. So we have the 13th Amendment ending slavery. So the 14th Amendment gives citizen right, citizenship rights. Citizenship the rights. Amendment gives you the right to vote. Or rather says that the right to vote cannot be denied based on these things. Um, so some of the states took this kind of race, creed, color, or previous condition of servitude, and would find other ways to deny Black people the vote. So we'll see later the rise of poll taxes and literacy tests, things like that. 
Um, so these qualifications that aren't necessarily tied to your race, color, or creed or your past servitude, but may have to do with, you know, these made up questions being made and asking you how many bars of, or how many bubbles can be made with a bar of soap, things like that. Other ways to disenfranchise Black people in addition to voter intimidation yeah. and violence. Yeah. Another good thing is that even though the 15th Amendment wasn't ratified until 1870, there were Blacks who were actually voting, even in St. Augustine prior to that, and some being elected to office as well. So the 15th Amendment just assured that those laws couldn't be used against them to prevent them from voting. Mm -hmm. And so then we have uh, February 21st, 1870, so a couple of days ago, a couple of years ago, the first of the three enforcement acts, also known as the Ku Klux Klan Acts, was passed by Congress. And so this was specifically to combat attacks on the voting rights of African Americans from either state officials or the violent groups, the extra military, what's the word, extra judicial groups like Ku Klux Klan. Exactly. Um, so while this is going on, Florida has a uh, Republican governor from the North. And he is repeatedly requesting federal assistance to help curtail this kind of scourge of violence and racial terror that's happening in Florida. And he is being repeatedly denied. <laughs> Another um, interesting point with the KKK Act, Kimberlin, is that here we are a hundred and some years later and that same act was used this past week to file a lawsuit, um, the NAACP filed a lawsuit against um, several people uh, including um, former um, Trump attorney uh, Rudy Giuliani and um, former President Trump and some others um, citing the Ku Klux Klan Act as the grounds because of the uh, combat and the attack against the Capitol, not just the building, but against state officials while they were in the process of conducting state business. So we'll see how that goes. Yeah, I mean, this this last couple of years is showing us what's What's passed is never passed, and it's barely, you know. Here's a mm -hmm. Faulkner quote in there that I messed That's up. That's why history is important. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we love it. So we're gonna move on to talk about some census information. So, in 1860, the black population in St. Augustine uh, was about 34 percent of. Well, really, the enslaved population was 34 percent of St. Augustine's general population. There were 74 free blacks reported within the city. And so what you see on your screen is actually from the census of 1864. So this was a military census. And um, it was done November of 1864. And it really kind of captures information. Um, it was done by the US Army's Department of the South. And so this census for our area includes Jacksonville, Fernandina, and St. Augustine. And so it was done to kind of keep track of people who would be receiving military rations. What's really notable, notable about this is, um, let's see. So just like our other one, we have the height here, we have your eye color, we have your complexion. Um, in the fourth one, we have if you're listed as contraband or where you're from, if you were not previously enslaved, your last known place of residence. Um, and then in the next column, it refers to your former owner. So again, or enslaver rather. So again, we have this kind of tacit tie. So you can look back in these records and connect the names to the families. Um, something else really interesting. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, the third from, no, the second from the right, it has the oath of office. So you can see the yeses. So these people on this list, this image that we have here have already taken the oath of office to be readmitted back into the union, which is, it's kind of cool. I like this image a lot. Um, and so something that we thought that was kind of interesting, Gail, is that even though we, there are names here um, that are denoted as being freeborn or always free, they're still listed as contraband. So it's like contraband is kind of a, a catch-all term for Black people, not necessarily people who were formerly enslaved. Um, um, something that I found really interesting going through this, so there were 330 355 total people listed as contraband. Of those, 32 were listed as being always free or freeborn. Three were brought bought free by their family members, which is really cool. And then two were manumitted by their former enslavers. So you can get a lot of information from these records. They're really interesting. Um, Absolutely. And, yeah. okay. 
Nope. No, that's all, right. all I was going to add. I said you absolutely <laughs> can get a lot of information from them because they paint the story of uh, what the population was like during that time. And I think sometimes as we're going through it as, as Black women, it's, it's troubling to look at the language that was used mm. because it's, it, to, in today's, um, it would be offensive to us. Uh, but, you know, we have to look at it from a historical perspective and put it into that light so that um, we're not uh, changing the history that's left here. We're just trying to shed light on what it was. So um, I think uh, you're waiting for me to talk a little bit now, right? <laughs> so, okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about reconstruction in St. Augustine uh, and in Lincolnville. When we say Lincolnville, because we are the Lincolnville Museum and Cultural Center and most of our history is about this um, district of, of St. Augustine. But not everyone that came back to St. Augustine uh, settled in Lincolnville. And I wanted to make that clear that they settled in other parts of the city like Charlotte Street or St. George's Street or went back to homes that they had before. Uh, so um, we know that St. Augustine in the St. Augustine Improvement Company actually transformed former orange groves into uh, plots of land in the Lincolnville area that were later sold to um, uh, returning uh, USCT troops. And they first, when they first settled here, they called it Little Africa. And that's not unusual because there were hundreds or thousands of settlements throughout the country of uh, newly emancipated, newly free people that started settlements in some towns that were called um, Freedmen's uh, or Little Africa or Africa or something um, like that. There are a lot of Lincolnvilles also or Lincoln Towns. And, and so those names were pretty common during that time. So that's how we get Lincolnville in homage to President Lincoln. But by 1866, there were at least five families, according to an article that came out in the Harper's Bazaar that says, or actually this is from a teacher who was uh, here as one of the teachers in um, Friedman School. She said that there were at least five families who had already settled in Lincolnville by 1866 and that there were others who actually owned land. So that's really early. That's like one year after the war that you have families actually establishing home sites, which is which is a, a, a great part of history that we, we like to share with people when they come to the Lincolnville Museum as well. These families, um, after the war, many of them, if they had homes, if they were free before the war, they may have had a place to go back to. But many of them had to find ways to meet their basic needs. They had to find jobs, in other words. And so Freedmen's Bureau was, that Kimberlin talked about earlier, there was also there that helped them with the transition into um, you know, private life. And I say private life as opposed to um, indentured or enslaved life, which is not the same as indentured life. I'm quite aware of that, but that they had to be in control of their own destiny, so to speak, that they had to earn a living to support their families. They had to find homes to live in. They had to find um, all those things. So to help them with that transition, the Freedmen, Freedmen's Bureau actually rationed clothing, they rationed food, and uh, they operated hospitals. They helped them with marital license because some of the people who had been enslaved were, they had what we call slave marriages where their partners were sometimes even dictated by those um, um, slaveholders that you're gonna get with them and you're gonna you know, produce this um, offspring that I'm going to be able to take and use as, at will. And some of those people were involuntary um, slave marriages um, that they maintain after emancipation. But many of them, um, because those marriages were not recognized legally, they would have to be relicensed uh, or licensed. And yeah, the Freedom yeah. Bureau did a lot of that. Um, that was one of the things that was uh, interesting looking at some of those. They said that they even had up to 50 to 100 people sometimes because there were so many, there was such a frequency of people who wanted to be legally married that they would do mass weddings. So a lot of the records we have actually were kept in Jacksonville through the Freedmen's Bureau when it was there. And we'll see some, of, uh, we'll, we'll show you. I think we have copies of one of those a little later on that we'll show you, right? Okay, so um, 
That's where um, Veterans Assistance was also a part of it. And we have tons of records about that. And that's a part of what the students are gonna be going through as well. And that was the, the Bureau was used to help them um, in filing their claims uh, for disability and pension benefits and back pay. And many of the records we have are their longstanding appeals for benefits that were questioned. There were questions about the validity of the marriages, if it was the woman requesting a pension for her husband. There was even questions about the paternity of their children and, you know, questions about their disability, which I found very, very disturbing. And so um, of the 68,178 men who died while serving in the union, only 270, 2,700, a little over 2,700 actually died in combat. But most of what they died from were the diseases that they contracted like malaria and tuberculosis and things that um, stayed with them longer. And those are things they were filing uh, complaints for. We have uh, one here and I'm gonna try to read a little bit of it. And this is um, a person, William Maddox, who appeared in uh, Duval County, which is where the medical examiner's office was um, uh, established. And uh, we know now that that was because that's where the Freedmen's Bureau was. And so when I say medical examiner's office, I don't mean the, the coroner, I mean the doctor that would have been examining them. And so um, he says that his had a disease of the lung, that's what they have written here. And that was a frequent complaint among them, but it was also one that was frequently denied. Um, not that easy to prove, but you know, people would talk about coughs that they had and how they had to spend long uh, nights on wet cold grounds while they were in the military. And so many of those were denied um, throughout the time uh, that we had um, people applying for them. So um, we had them, um, the veterans had to jump through a lot of hoops just uh, you know, to get through the bureaucratic process. They would crisscross from one office to the other, from one doctor's office to the other. And there's one case, um, and we don't have a picture of it here, but where um, the soldiers would leave the city and go to another city and they would get a, a disability um, you know, report that they had 75% disability. They'd come back to Jacksonville and then they would still be denied. That, then the doctors there would say, oh, you only have 0% disability or 5%. So it wasn't enough to qualify them to get um, disability pay. And the widows, they were um, also dragged into the process. Um, they had to provide proof of their marriages. And we just told you that they didn't always have that. So that was why that was a big thrust of the Freedmen's Bureau to be able to provide that. They had to prove parentage of their children. And that was before we had DNA tests to prove that. So can, you can imagine what that, they, they interviewed people in the neighborhood to say, oh, is this woman, was she loyal to this soldier? Did, was that really his wife? Was she a loose woman? And those kind of things that were really demeaning. So um, we have a lot of those benefits being denied over time. They were already um, having a hard time, but the moral dilemma that came along with that of being humiliated by people questioning whether you were actually married or whether this man was actually the father of your children. Yeah. I can only yeah. imagine what those feelings were like for those women back then when they were still trying to provide for their families. Exactly. Um, something else I wanted to know, you read about the disease of lungs. He had so many things listed here. Dimness of vision on account of injury to eyes, injury to right arm from having been broken in two places from a fall shortly after the war, 61 to 65. Trouble of wind, like he had a lot going on. And also mm -hmm. something that I wanted to know, I should have put a second one in here, but we see that this document is dated 1866. The last document in his file was either 1890 or 1893. Wow. So like over the decades, he'd been fighting to get this recognized. Was he still alive when they recognized it or was it after the fact that he had it was already still, passed it was, it was still, well, I'll have to go back and look because I believe yeah. it was something I don't remember seeing a widow's name, but he was 41 when this first one was filed. So <laughs> we'll see about that. <laughs> wow. So more to come on that, right? Yes. 
So we want to move on a little bit because I know we're running uh, short on time. So what we want to talk about now is what was it like starting a life? So here's a picture, and we we relied on this article that was quite an interesting article from this Saturday. Um, uh, uh, Here's weekly. Yes, thank you. I'm drawing a blank here, and it's right in front of me. But the, there, this woman had these two children, and 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 she, you know, it just depicts her and how she named them actually um, in honor of Lincoln. So I think one was. Um, and Mike, you, we didn't put the name in there, but they were like like Lola and Leela Lincoln, you know, and I'm just making up that name because that's not their first name, but we, we do have their names. But she was proud of the fact that Lincoln had emancipated the slaves enough that she gave her daughters his last name. And um, she would have been typical of uh, people starting over under the conditions after the uh, slavery. And so um, many women, because they were widowed because of the war, they had to raise their children on their own. Another thing, people had to search for their family members, search for their loved ones. And Kimberly, I know you were talking about um, Dr. Williams, who was here last year, talking about her book um, that goes into a lot of these stories. She used a lot of newspaper articles to get um, uh, as research for her um, uh, work that um, where people were actually looking um, for people. And, and this is not local, but it says my father, Phil Givens, left Owensburg, Kentucky 10 years ago for Missouri. Also my sister, Biddy Givens, it is said that they lived in Jackson, Missouri. Any information about them will be gladly received by writing to me in Owensburg, uh, Kentucky. And that's from Jane Givens. So that was not uncommon for people to put ads in the newspapers looking for loved ones. Because when we think about the beginning of the war where people left plantations following the um, Union soldiers, that they may have followed them to a, a Union camp somewhere. And, and, and over time, they may have been separated at the end of the war. Uh, and so they are not sure if their loved ones are still alive or dead and they are taking everything they know every means that they can to try and find out where they were where their whereabouts sorry about that so let's move on a little bit unless you want to add something to that i just wanted to say the name of dr williams was help me to find my people really well done she really talks about like you really just have to think like these families were separated for so long and just so desperate to find each other after emancipation by any means necessary, whether it's traveling themselves, trying to find information, asking desperately if people were going in that general direction to find word and write back. Like some people who even couldn't read or write themselves, but having to get these letters written out for them and relayed and hoping for any information, like it really, it really tugs at your heart to think about it. It does. So remind me to tell you a story. It's not really relative to this, but it is somewhat uh, later about a relative in my family who disappeared and was found in 1988. That descendants showed up at a family reunion in Miami. So um, that's uh, over a hundred years that people were just separated, and we didn't know. We thought that they were like long gone, but um, they sh their descendants showed up and introduced themselves. Oh, we're the descendants of this um, family member and we were all shocked that we all embraced them and we we're just happy that they have been found. So we will move along. So one of the ways that people, we're gonna talk about all the ways people found a way to make a living. And, and in St. Augustine, as we said, there wasn't as big of a deal of sharecropping because sharecropping requires large plots of land that's being farmed for people to lease out and, and, and farm. And we know that that did happen in parts of the county, but in terms of St. Augustine itself, we didn't have a lot of that. The uh, orange groves that were one of the big cash crops in St. Augustine was divided up. I um, would also say that another orange grove that was here that had been operated also by the Buckingham um, Smith family um, with a man whose name was Satiki, we'll, you'll see more about him as we go forward too, that he was given the right in 1871 to be able to use whatever proceeds from the sale of those fruits for himself for the duration of his life. And so um, that was one of the other things, but one of some of the other um, professions that people listed were that they, um, 
worked in citrus groves and indigo, cotton, that um, corn, potatoes, and pulp plantations. Um, there are also some other jobs that they listed. Some started small businesses as barbers. They were delivery men, hack drivers, as you see here. And it's an interesting hack driver who's actually riding an oxen uh, with a cart. Uh, there were also um, people who said that they were waiters, that they were um, in the boat building business, and all those things that became a part of the St. Augustine um, as part of the um, landscape. Not a lot of women were listed. I know, Kimberly, you looked at some of the uh, census uh, and the occupations that were listed there, and we noticed that, that there were not a lot of women that were listed, but this woman who was only referred to as Aunt Viney, which was common for the way that people refer to black women that may or may not have been her name, but you know, maybe she told them her name was Viney. So she became Aunt Viney or, you know, just like Satiki was known as Uncle Jack. And so that was just the way that people were referred to. Uh, that she actually sold uh, handmade goods, baked goods and stuff on the street. And that's the way she earned a living for herself. There are others who um, did other things. And, and some of those businesses uh, became a part of the legacy of Lincolnville that as they passed on and, and, and descendants continued to build on those businesses as time went by. I'm gonna move on to education because education was another one of those areas where um, after the war, it was very important. So, um, and this is another picture of uh, where I talked about Jack. Are we skipping forward? I yeah. Already talked about <laughs> okay, because in that picture was also showing that being laundresses was another way that women earned the money, earned money. And so um, education, this is not necessarily in St. Augustine, but we know that education became a big part of the landscape for black people. And um, I had a, a quote from Booker T. Washington, even though he was just a, 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 a wee lad at the time, he quoted his grandmother as saying, how beautiful to see an entire race of people learning to read together for the first time. And that was her description of seeing rooms of children and parents and grandparents all learning for the first time. Uh, so in St. Augustine, we had the National Freedmen's Relief Association and the Freedmen's Aid Society of Jacksonville, who had estimated about 160 students participating in classes. St. Augustine also um, had, um, uh, over time, let me just back up a minute. The Freedmen's Bureau helped to establish schools also but they also um, worked with these other associations to establish schools. So the Peabody Fund, which was another one of those private um, associations, they established the first free public schools in this area. One for whites, which is on the corner of Artillery Lane and Avila Street, and one for blacks on Spanish. In Lincolnville, later in time on Central Avenue, right across from the Lincolnville Museum, and that vacant lot that you see over there used to be the Cooper School. It was established for Negro students back in 1868. And this is a 2008, I believe, painting of what the school looked like at the time. It was named Cooper School after the Presbyterian minister, who was also the headmaster for the school. And the Peabody's actually did not like the idea of all Blacks going to Catholic schools. So they wanted to... Um, have a diff, uh, not just all blacks, but the, at that time the Catholic school was pretty much what was offered. So they wanted to offer an alternative for our students to be able to go. And that school was located, this particular one across from the Lincolnville Museum. Another person who was very much instrumental in the education of people in the state of Florida had several different roles that he plays. His name was Jonathan Gibbs. He served as Secretary of State from 1868 to 1872. He also served as um, Secretary of Public Instruction. As you can see, as Kimberlyn is pointing out with her arrow here, that he was one of the signers on Florida's new um, constitution. He had run for public office, actually ran for Congress and he lost, but he was asked to join this constitutional convention to rewrite Florida's constitution 
as it re-entered the union and he was um, proud to sign his name there. Gibbs also was um, like many um, post reconstruction or reconstruction uh, era blacks. He also was a minister and he was a Presbyterian minister. He served at a church in Jacksonville. And while he was there, he also established a school. And I might also add um, that uh, historian Cantor Brown writes about, um, you know, some of the situations in Jacksonville. And it said, while it established the state's most liberal character to that day, it incorporated, and this is about the Constitution, it incorporated most restrictions on Black political power. It remitted most former rebels to vote, which Kimberlin talked about them being, you know, um, pardoned. But this allowed them to vote at the same time specifying a legislative apportionment plan that discriminated against Black majority counties in favor of sparsely populated white counties. The drafters retain one item especially important to Black leaders. The Constitution directed the legislature to create a uniform system of public schools. So even though Blacks got public schools out of that, we also got um, districting or, or reapportionment out of that, which still we live with today as a legacy of this early Florida Constitution, which this is the year that district lines get redrawn again. So that's still a part of that original Constitution heritage um, from the post-war uh, Constitution that we still live with. We can move on to the next one. I kind of bridges what we're going to be talking about next, but you're talking about Catholic education. So in 1866, the Sisters of St. Joseph, St. Mm -hmm. Joseph came to um, the St. John's area and end up here in, in St. Augustine as well. So they come, we'll talk about them more in our next installment, but yeah, their Absolutely. presence here definitely made yeah. it. Yeah, and they're already here when Peabody comes and that's why his impact is like, I want to offer an alternative to, to that. And, and we plan to do a lot more of that when we talk about, um, especially going into, cause it's a long transition. They are there for almost a hundred years that school doesn't close until 1968, mm -hmm. but we'll talk about the nuns and we'll talk about the Jim Crow laws that affected the school and all of that in our next segment. Thank you for reminding me of that. I was getting ahead of myself. <laughs> so this is a picture showing uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, which is right, I don't know, Kimberlyn, if you can point to that, I don't have a uh, pointer, but she's the lady down front here at the right side. And Jonathan Gibbs is way up here by the columns up here um, as um, part of this uh, picture that was made at, uh, in Tallahassee at the Capitol um, back in the late 1860s. So um, the other thing that we want to point out about Gibbs, and I don't want to get too far past that while we're talking about education, is that he also was the person that was instrumental in helping us start like uh, what we know is FAMU. And there are a lot of other things that are named after him, but he was a part of that, um, you know, Florida industrial education for blacks uh, in the state of Florida. So free education, we owe a lot to public education to Jonathan Gibbs. And um, so we're thankful for him. Um, um, something so, that I kind of want to talk about since we're talking about education is like, it was, really monumental to have this push for public education across the board like poor white families really benefited from this as well and the fact that like Absolutely. nobody was really trying to educate people who didn't have money in like a mass way before this um and so you see this kind of come up later so just the fact that there was the two peabody schools that were established not too far from and two Catholic schools as well. Let's not forget that, but they had to pay to attend those schools. You know, um, even the Peabody School, the Cooper School, people had to pay. And so by the time we get to the early 1900s, when we get the, um, you know, the first school here at this site in 1902, we're um, going towards, moving towards a free public education, but they still were assessed a small amount, I think, um, that the parents had to pay. Uh, and I, I thank you for pointing out that um, even though 
even the Freedman School, they were available to whites to go, those early schools, but most didn't go because they didn't want to be in a, in a school with, with, with Blacks. And also there were white teachers that came down and eventually Black codes were passed against that, which is what we see going into the Jim Crow era in 1912, I think, when the nuns were actually arrested here in St. Augustine. So we're going back to family life because here's Satiki at his little cabin. And this lady, I think her name was um, July, or no, her name was Sarah. And they were actually um, a part of, of the will of Buckingham Smith. But it shows you, you know, he continued to live in this little cabin. And she may have just been doing their laundry, but she may have been taking in laundry for pay from other people in the community because at this point, they are having to um, take care of themselves. So he is, you know, this awesome farmer. He's by now a minister as well. So he's getting money from that. He's selling the fruit from the citrus grove. So they, even though he's still living in his slave cabin because that's where he wants to live. And we can talk about that in another topic of, you know, what the options were for that. But um, it just shows that People use whatever they could and they had to use their hands and they had to use, you know, um, just basic human uh, energy to create money and wealth for themselves and, and, and create to make a living for themselves. One of the things that happened in St. Augustine that um, people really were anxious to improve their lot and, you know, get an education. And this is not just unique to St. Augustine, it happened everywhere, but most of them had to live in small houses like this. Even the house we showed you in Lincolnville, they were not grand houses like what we see today when we think about St. Uh, Lincolnville as being this Victorian uh, home mecca, uh, you know, that it was in 1991. Didn't exist at that time. It was um, still pretty much um, small. Um, close to squatter houses or huts like this. Some of them had thatched roofs. Some of them may have um, later been able to have a, a roof with shingles and so forth. But it was very, very basic kind of living that they did. Because St. Augustine was more like city life, you had people who, um, they also probably um, most likely went back to work for people in their homes for pay they were related they were aware or they were familiar with the layout of the city so they were able to move about the city pretty easily and another factor i think is that as we look even when we look back at some of those census records but there were many who were mulatto who were also maybe got more favor because of that because they were family members that they related to and as we look through the census we see excuse me even though a lot of people took on like Jack Smith, we know he was born in Africa. He took on the name of Buckingham Smith, but others took on those names because those were, um, they were um, a part of that family system in terms of being enslaved there, but some of them were actually offspring. Mm -hmm. And um, we didn't talk about this in education, but some of those early institutions of higher learning actually were, um, designed for their offspring so that they could go and get an education. And we know that uh, one local person that uh, we love to tell the story about is Alexander Darner, who was a young soldier. He wasn't even a soldier. He was a enslaved person in the home of Kirby Smith, who had been a union general, became a Confederate general. He took him to war with him. Kirby Smith was wounded. And this young man nursed him while he was, um, you know, recovering and he came back. Um, Kirby Smith's sister arranged for um, Alexander Darner to go to um, Lincoln University and eventually he went to Howard Medical School and became the first black doctor in the state of Florida. So that was, a. Uh, am getting off subject, I know, Cameron, but <laughs> I love to do that because Another thing, you know, I keep mentioning Buckingham Smith, and I, I can't, uh, I can't ignore this because it is a part of the legacy of Lincolnville and St. Augustine. This was what was first built as a home for the colored and the aged in St. Augustine, and it was called the Buckingham Smith, you know, home. 
that um, part of the how this came about was that that man, Satiki, that I showed you, Jack Smith in his cabin, he influenced Buckingham Smith and Buckingham Smith left him the use of that land for as long as he lived and he lived about another uh, 10 years or more after Buckingham Smith. But because it, Buckingham Smith left this legacy, I'm gonna leave the buckle my estate for the care of the poor colored people of St. Augustine. Some of his friends came together because there was only about $25,000 in there and some stock certificates and so forth. So they put more money into it. They built a home for the aged here. And this was a, a three-story structure. And uh, according to some of the local history, the people didn't really want to live there because, you know, here again, it's attributed to the fact that they wanted to live a place that was close to the ground that they could easily maneuver in and out of. That was, you know, that's what's recorded. You know, we don't have any way of proving whether it was true or not. But anyway, that home eventually was sold and it became the Buckingham Hotel. And I think it was burned um, uh, during a fire in like 1904 or something like that. But they did eventually build two other facilities in St. Augustine, one that was right next door to this museum built about the same time and later another, but that was the first nonprofit organization in the state of Florida. So that's another little sidebar piece. We're gonna talk about religion. I'm getting, I'm getting your message. So Methodism, um, even though we're showing this, I'll talk about this first. St. Mary's Baptist Church. It's one of the oldest Baptist churches here in St. Augustine. And St. Mary's was also represented the first all black denomination here in St. Augustine. Prior to that, we had Methodism that, inclu that uh, included churches that were both um, mi had mixed congregation. So we can see that this church was actually organized in 1875. The building still exists today, um, the, the new St. Mary's, which was built in 1920s. It became a part of the civil rights movement in the 1960s. And some of these names that are on here, are some of those same early family names that we know like Sanks and the Weldon, uh, Keltons, the Jelks, we keep seeing these names over and over again. So um, as we continue to dig through these records, I'm sure we'll be able to bring you more stories about some of these individuals as well. But one of the things about religion in St. Augustine and throughout the South is that um, some of the historians write that there was a lot of mixture of some African um, practices in terms of um, ancestral religion that was involved in uh, some of the practices. So it wasn't just uh, uh, just Methodism as uh, the American version of Methodism. It was some other things that were included in there. So I'm not gonna go into a whole lot about that, but we do know that um, uh, even Jonathan Gibbs who had been uh, trained at Dartmouth, um, he and James Weldon Johnson described uh, a woman known as Aunt Vinnie out of respect for her age. They said that uh, she um, the champion of all rank shouters at St. Paul's Church in Jacksonville. And so they were not really thrilled with that whole idea of the rank shouters because it was kind of like, we're trying to move away from that. We're trying to be more sophisticated. And here we are today in 2020 where people are looking for rank shouters. The Gullah Geechee Quarter Pre Preservation Quarter highlights the rank shouters as a part of the African heritage and culture of Black people in America. So I think it's interesting that we look at history and we find the things that people viewed one way at that point in the history. And now we can examine it from a different perspective and now be proud of the fact that that was a part of our heritage. Definitely. So we need to move along because my time, I talk a lot. <laughs> so I talked about um, uh, these people. They were actually, these were the first black senators. You're know, probably the last ones for a long, long time, I'm sure. Um, that's what history tells us. But these were the first, still have a hard time using that word, but first colored senators and representatives in the House. And we know that um, there were a couple of people who, who were here. Everybody knows the name of Hiram Revels. And there was another man who was from Jacksonville. And uh, he was also um, a part of uh, that, uh, delegation um, 
uh, Kimberly, what's his name? Because right now I'm joining Blank and it's not in front of me. Josiah T. Walls. Thank you, Josiah yeah. T. Walls. He was from Jacksonville, which I should know since that's my hometown. But he was also uh, a part of that delegation. And that's as close as St. Augustine got to the national because we had a lot of local um, elected officials. We had more than two dozen local elected officials mm -hmm. from 1866, as I said, to 1902. And um, they were everything from tax collectors, city councilmen, county commissioners, uh, marshal, and some of them were elected to the same office more than one. Some of them were, uh, same people were elected to several different offices over time. And it all came to a pretty abrupt end. Um, Oh, before we move on, I just wanted to say, um, so we have here a lot of the representatives and, and senators would come from states with like a really big voting populace. So like Hiram Revels and Blanche K. Bruce both came from Mississippi. Mm -hmm. So Hiram Revels was the first to serve. The first, yes. He was elected in 1870 to finish a term of somebody else. And then Blanche K. Bruce in 1875 was the first to serve a complete term. Um, and so then we have our local guy, uh, Josiah T. Walls in the middle. Um, but just looking at these kind of reconstruction era senators, I think, if I remember correctly, the next black senator was until 1867. So almost a hundred years later with Edward, mm -hmm. Edward Brook from Massachusetts, I wanna say. Right, right. Um, yeah. So it, it's still like a notable thing to have Absolutely. I think there was one black representative from Chicago, but he was in the House, he's not in the Senate. And uh, I think they said that he was the first uh, Northern, uh, Northern Democrat to be elected to um, the House of Representatives because the Southerners were all Democrats. So for him to be, I think he's from Illinois, from the state of Illinois. Mm. So um, what really happened, um, we have um, that brings a national reconstruction to an end is the removal of federal troops. And how did that happen? We talked a lot about that last week. And for anybody that missed that, I'm just give you a quick recap that the election of 1877, there was a compromise made, which would make um, Rutherford B. Hayes, the Republican president, if, the Union troops were withdrawn from those areas, mainly Florida, Louisiana, and South Carolina. So um, that happened pretty quickly. The, the troops were pulled out. The, um, it signaled the removal of any safeguard in the former Confederate states against white supremacy and rural terror as a way of life. The elections for the most part became a white male privilege once Again, St. Augustine was an outlier because we did have Blacks who were continually elected until 1902, which I, I talked about. And um, so the presence in, of soldiers in St. Augustine in the military actually kept a lot of um, local requests to um, install a Confederate monument in the city square away. The, the, the uh, ruins of this monument that you see here became the base for the Confederate monument that was just removed this past um, summer. And it was on the grounds of the Catholic Church. It was destroyed partially in a fire on um, the top portion of it, as you can see, um, was um, actually reconstructed. And the plaques that you see here are the same plaques that ended up on the four sides of that monument, but it was reconstruction, reconstructed after the federal troops moved out. And how did it get to be there? Because the, um, the daughters of the Confederacy, who were very um, much instrumental in um, you know, promoting the uh, memorials for commemorating those who had been lost from the Confederacy, they pushed to get that monument in the plaza. So after the troops moved out, it was um, pretty much a done deal. So by 1897, you see that monument actually um, being installed in the plaza. As I said, in 1902, um, the town marshal um, depicted here, Marshal Benet shoots a city councilman. And who was that city councilman? John Papino 
Who was he? They say he was colored. He was painfully wounded. They were in the middle of a, of a city commission meeting and um, the marshal had presented a budget to the uh, council and Papino questioned items in the budget for police uniforms. And we're going back to those black codes now. You have to remember, you're not supposed to look a white man in the eye if you're black. You're not supposed to talk back to them because even though you may be an elected official, you are still not to view yourself as being equal to a white man. So he pulls out his gun and he shoots him in the face. And of course, people, uh, the councilmen as well, they scatter. Everybody has um, suddenly to leave. Um, no immediate charges are uh, filed, but Bennett turns himself in. The judge who uh, over um, saw the case said in some reports that he didn't um, see the reason for filing any complaints right away because the man was able to walk out, you know, even though he was bloody and shot in the face. That was the last elected official in St. Augustine until the 18, I think it was uh, 1979. It, what I want to say, um, and I don't have it here in front of me in my notes, but uh, the election of um, uh, Henry Twine would have been the next Black person in the city of St. Augustine. And unfortunately, there were only one or two after him, and maybe only one that, um, that I know about. So it's, it's overdue. It's time for uh, some more um, representation. The other thing that happened is, you know, you had that return to local rule. So we're going to just talk a little bit about some of the um, legacies of, of what was left behind here. And, you know, you, you see these points on there, but we had a promise. Do you want to do this or you want me to do them? I'll jump in. You yeah, I know you will. So there was a promise of a book. Go ahead. <laughs> there is this idea of um, this promise of a multiracial republic where Black people could be fully involved in the nation as voters, as citizens with full rights, the same equal to whites. Um, and for a time, the radical Republicans were moving towards that. And um, unfortunately, through a combination of just the compromise being made in 77, just general support among white supporters not really being what it was in the beginning um, and this intense lobbying by the South for them to return to home rule and to let Southern, Southerners decide Southern business kind of makes an end of that. Um, so even though there was like local pushback against the Black codes and things that were made to limit Black freedom and the kind of participation in Black life or not even Black life but American life. Um, those would ultimately be stifled and replaced with Jim Crow in the really close, closely coming years. So we have moving from Black people being voters and being in public office to don't be on the sidewalk if you're passing a white person, don't look a white person in the eye, I can dispute what you're saying and if, if it comes to blows I can kill you and nothing will really happen to me. It can just be a dispute and I shot you and that was kind of the yeah. end of it. Yep. Um, and so just like even seeing that playing out at the governmental level here is like, it's so crazy to me. Um, so that's kind of one legacy of Reconstruction, this mm -hmm. promise of this multiracial republic that wasn't quite delivered. But we do have the positive advances of Black people. So Gail talked about before the establishment mm -hmm. of historically Black colleges and universities through this legislation. Like we have FAMU, um, one of the public, if not the only public, HBCU in Florida. Um, we also just have general, oh, you were going to talk about Downer here, that's where it was going to come up, but we have <laughs> the general advancements of being in the voting populace, of being able to negotiate pay once you had the support sometimes of the Freedmen's Bureau. Just being able to move freely and not being a, a person who's being kind of enslaved and just exploited for your labor. Um, just having the freedom. To also, you know, labor unions uh, for blacks came into play during this time as well. So mm -hmm. that was another uh, legacy of Reconstruction that they were able to, um, you know, join labor unions and negotiate, as you said, for pay. But then, 
in the years immediately after Reconstruction, we have this idea of this white supremacist reconciliation that sweeps the nation. So it's not just a Southern thing, it's Northern boredom with kind of the issue of repeatedly pressing for black rights. People felt like enough had been done um, and they kind of didn't have to do any more. And so this kind of reconciliation narrative was spread across the nation. And so historian David Blight talks about this in his book, Race and Reunion, highly recommend it, great read. But he just talks about how racial justice and kind of this possibility, like we said, of the multiracial republic was cast aside for um, the sake of uniting the nation for white people. And it was just kind of this idea of, you know, like, the, the war wasn't really about slavery. It was it was so long ago, 20 years yeah. ago. I don't even remember. Why were we even fighting, brother? Why were we even fighting? Let's all come together and not really worry about what's going on. We'll Absolutely. let you all return to south uh, to um, self-rule and just kind of let the nation go back to normalcy. Unfortunately, yeah. that normalcy included the resubjugation of Black people into sharecropping, developing into the Jim Crow laws that we'll talk about next time. So because this idea of this inequality and everything springing from slavery that was never truly rectified and looked at and um, dealt with at the end of the war and instead we just went for this kind of, re not revisionist, but this reconciliist attitude, uh, white supremacy was able to prevail and continue and fester and grow. Um, so this directly feeds into this idea of the lost cause myth. So kind of this, the lost cause is the idea that the South's plight during the Civil War was one that was noble. And so the white Southerners were fighting this noble, tragic cause against these corrupt Northern Republicans and these illiterate Black people who didn't know what they were doing. And we have this, you know, this Secretary of State and this public, um, public educator Gibbs, who was educated at Dartmouth. So, you know, we have that going on. So a Northern educated man who was a minister, but no, there was this idea that the South was just being led to ruin by the rest of the nation and that the cause for the Civil War was a noble one and um, to kind of redeem the South from what had happened. So you get these people who are the redeemers who are starting to write this Southern mm -hmm. history that puts the, puts the history of reconstruction, the history of the civil war through that lens. So then in the 1900s to the 1920s, you get this historian out of Columbia called uh, William Dunning. And so he has this school, the Dunning School. So mm -hmm. for the next generation or so, he and his students are the premier experts on reconstruction and reconstruction to them was a corrupt moral failure full of embezzling Northern Republicans who were the carpetbaggers who rushed South to kind of exploit the South and the scallywags who were the local mm -hmm. uh, white Southerners who went along with it. And then the black people who've never there, oh, what did he say? He were like, he said they were just out of Barbary who are now running everything. So this and was the, the interesting thing is there were only a handful of blacks that were actually even in Congress, you know, so it wasn't like they were ever in control of yeah. any state legislature or anything. So that's what, you know, makes it so preposterous that, it, you know, the people believe that or the people believe what they wanted to believe, I think. And that's why we call it a lost cause, because it's like, even though there was this big fight where people fought for freedom for themselves and for others, that they were belittled by all these people and then for um, scholars to, 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 to turn it into uh, this big myth that we were, we, that's the way I learned it growing up. It's, it's like, there were no, well, there were some, I mean, we had Du Bois and people who were writing way back when, but, you know, the stories were not being told the way they're told today in terms of what actually happened in the, in the Civil War, that they were just, um, you know, it was over states' rights, as you said, or it was over, you know, um, the right um, you know, for people not to be able to tell you what to do with your property. And, you know, when we look at humans as being a part of that property, it's really heartbreaking to know that somebody would pervert that and say that it wasn't over that. When we look at the records, the financial records, especially to see the, the large amounts of um, 
income uh, that was lost um, after, you know, during the reconstruction period because they didn't have people to pick their crops for free. And yeah. even during yeah. the war that, and, and, and you have farmers making statements saying that, you know, I can't do this because my, now I'm only going to make $200 instead of $2,000 for my crop. And so it's just a, a, a blatant lie. I mean, Kimberly, you're saying it very nicely, but I can't. <laughs> so it's a way that it was yeah. promoted. And I, I don't want to get emotional here, but it's like, I think it's so good that we're able to have a, a, a platform like this and like this museum and museum, the Smithsonian and all the African-American history museums and universities and writers throughout this country that have gone to great lengths to put this story right. And you know the backlash that they're getting, that we're getting from people who still don't want this story to be told, you know? So it's yeah. still yeah. an ongoing struggle to put the truth out about what really happened. And I thank God for uh, the military, because when I look for all the exhibits that we've done, all the military records are the most accurate uh, picture of what happened. It's how we did our World War II exhibit. It's how we do everything because looking at those records, it's like they were very meticulous. Like you said, right down to the color of your hair and the color of your eyes and all of that stuff. And and so you can't go back and erase that. And it was in it was in writing. It wasn't like somebody typed it and then you know whited it out and typed it again. It was handwritten notes that they had. So. Uh, thank God that you're here, that you can, you love doing the research and I love having you do it because you're good at it. And uh, we have our students at UNF that are helping us do this research and we look forward to bringing you guys more um, in the future, um, digging into the records more and being able to share more about Lincolnville history as we go forward. Um, join us um, in the future. Oh, wait, we don't, go ahead, do you have questions? Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Not questions, but we've gone through all of them. So basically what I wanted to say really briefly, you hinted at it. So they were black historians like Du Bois and John Hope Franklin. Du Bois writes black reconstruction directly in response to this stunning interpretation of reconstruction as a failure. So there have been people way back when, before it became the dominant narrative to kind of push back and relook at I mean, it's, or reconstruction who were looking at it. So that brings us to today, right before we close, we've kept you all so long. Thank you all for still being here. We love that <laughs> one. I knew this was gonna be the longest one. It was good though. <laughs> but um, today we're once again at a time where we're dealing with racial justice as a national issue. And so it's going to be kind of in a way, another reconstruction to see which which course will the nation take? Will we deal with these issues that have been plaguing us for years? Or will we take the reconstruction, the end of reconstruction route and choose a white supremacist reconciliation where we gloss over everything and make it seem like it's okay to return back to normal. That's where yeah. I leave. <laughs> All right, so I would also like to say, you know, if we're going to tell this history, because we have students coming here and they say, oh, I didn't read that in my history book. You didn't read it in your history book, but we are hoping in the future it will be in the history books that um, will be some new writers, young writers, young historians like yourself who will make sure that the real stories get told in a way that our students can uh, get it. And, um, you know, it, 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 it really... I spoke today to a group and I said, one of the reasons why we do um, black history is so young black people can see themselves in positive light and that other people can see uh, uh, African-Americans in a positive light. And that doesn't mean that all our stories are positive, you know that they're not, but that there was always a pushback against every negative thing that happened. So I woke up this morning with a song in my heart and it was basically about, um, a day that we can wake up when there would no longer be a view with a hue. And to me, it was saying, when can we look at people and not see the color of their skin, but look at the content of their character and let that be how we uh, judge people. And so that's what we hope to do here. That's what we hope that you guys are all doing. And we thank you. I know I go on and on and on, but thank you for joining us. And um, if there are no further questions, um, we're going to sign off, unless you have something else, Kimberlyn. Nope. Uh, this is final call for questions. <laughs> uh, we've been kind of hitting on some across 
see people are saying thank you they enjoyed listening thank you to everybody who came this is really great oop something popped up let's see oh no they're saying keep it up love the info this is more black history than was ever taught in school great okay well if we all don't have any questions thank you again so much for being with us um this will be posted on our youtube channel i'll post the last one in the next coming days um join us we don't have a date yet but part four will be on the creation and kind of implementation of Jim Crow. So you will see that coming from us soon on Eventbrite and Facebook and Instagram, everything. Um, check us yeah, out. Okay. At, go ahead. And I was gonna say, just keep checking our website because you have some other programs coming up as well that yeah. are a little bit different. And um, you know, we wanna make sure you guys uh, get a chance to participate in those. Uh, we have some speakers that are coming, so you don't just have to listen to us all the time, but um, we want you guys to um, participate in some of the other things. So look for um, notification about those upcoming events, and we will keep you posted on when the next segment of this series comes out. Thank you. So, it is LincolnvilleMuseum.org. I see that. <laughs> That's LincolnvilleMuseum.org. Perfect. And then I'll be emailing the links to you all since you attended. And um, have a good night. Stay safe. And we will see you at the next one. Bye. Bye. Good night.